You're listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. Thanks to Concordia University, Wisconsin for supporting The Coffee Hour. Find out more about Concordia University, Wisconsin at cuw.edu. Live Uncommon. It is Monday, which means it is Mental Health Monday. Check in with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. Good morning. Good morning. Great to be with you all again. Thanks for being with us. I know that you're traveling and so making some time for us for Mental Health Monday, greatly appreciated because we are continuing our conversation in emotions and the gospel. And this week we get into connection. Really excited. Great stories this week and looking ahead to next week as well. I'm not going to give any spoilers, but really great personal stories (laughs) both this week and next week. Always great stories each week. So connection. Um, let's back up a little bit. Last time we talked about exploration, which involved typically physical movement. I think there were dance parties in the kitchen, maybe, and associated with that one. (laughs) So today we take a look at connection. What are some examples of connection? Well, co-regulation is one of my favorite emotion terms because it reminds us that we are in this emotional life together, or life alone. We're actually in it together. And so connection through words is a favorite of mine, of course, like talking things through, but also even hug, right? Or a touch, a light touch, or being in the same space. We learned that with COVID, that being in the same space is regulating in itself, that physical connection. And so being able to be with another person in emotion in whatever which way, physically, conversationally or quietly, you know, with that space in between us is what we're going for with connection. What does this look like for us? You know, when we talk about experiencing emotions with other people, I think some people start to feel a little squeamish at that thought of talking about mm-hmm. stuff with other people. Yeah, you know. How is that? Is that a cultural thing? Is that a, is that a human nature thing? What, what, why do some people feel like that and some people are more comfortable in that space? Mm-hmm. I think, Jeff, like every other question about emotion, the answer is both and <laughs> over all of the above. Those layers are coming to bear in our lives. So internally as humans, because of what happened in the garden, because of our experience of sin and then shame coming into not just us, but the world, we are going to hold shame about certain things. And I think emotions are like that because they are so volatile, because they're so outside of our control, but we do have some control in it. And when you have those two things meet outside my control, but also a little bit in my control, I feel like that is a special place of shame for us as human beings. Because once there's a little bit of choice available, we tend as humans to broaden that to be all our choice. Then I did something wrong. My emotions are wrong. Also, because I don't think we have a lot culturally understanding about emotions. Like this is very new research. You know, so many cultures across time and space believe so many different things about emotions, some likely healthier than us. <laughs> And some of them a little bit unhelpful. And so in our culture, and even with brain science, we've talked about this before on our Mental Health Mondays with emotion, we're just getting to the beginning of that, um, you know, chipping away a little bit at understanding our emotions and what they do. But with a little less understanding or a lot less understanding comes a little more shame. Also, we're emotion, or we're information driven people. We feel better when we have information and we know in our minds. When we don't, it's a little uncomfortable and that shame creeps in a little bit easier. And then there is that extreme cultural overlay of how people believe, think, and act about emotion. And I think in our present time and space, we are not an emotion-friendly culture. We're a productivity-oriented culture, particularly in American Western culture. And we don't show a lot of space for emotions. I hope that the listener, and I hope you too, <laughs> have been able to find your people that can hold emotions with you, though. So not everybody gets our connection. You know, not everybody is going to be the person we can be vulnerable about things that are inside of us. And even maybe some emotion or some things that we're processing need to be in that still space with God 
and connecting with God, whether in prayer or in quiet and silence and in breath, those kind of things around the word are going to be in a space that are a beautiful place to process because God, we know in Jesus Christ, doesn't judge us outside of shame, right? He judges us in what Christ has done for us and all of that shame is gone. It's been put on the cross. And so that's a beautiful place to start connecting if you're uncomfortable with it. And then look at your circle of vulnerability. Who can hold this with me, whether verbally or just sitting next to me and saying, hey, I just need someone to be here with me in there. And, and perhaps maybe from another side of that, looking at how I can be that that connection for someone too, when someone's working through or processing emotion, how can I be that connection? And I think one of the most helpful things that I've learned so far in this book and through our conversations when it comes to emotions is the phrase that you've used multiple times, emotional soup, mm-hmm. and the concept that it's not all one thing. Like, yes, I might have really strong emotions at the moment, but it might not necessarily be just one emotion. There's this soup that's kind of a mix of <laughs> a, a, a hearty blend and it's all kind of intertwined <laughs> because it's soup. It's not just like they're adjacent to each other or that they're, but they're, and, and not even that they're just kind of touching these different emotions are not mm-hmm. just adjacent or touching, but kind of intertwined because it's soup and it's messy. Mm-hmm. And, and also they're like mm-hmm. different size pieces in it. So some emotions right. are bigger than others, but they're all still there. Yes. I love this. And they're all flavored by one another too, yes. in some way. Because of course I would make Metaphor. a food, a food analogy, right? So perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> but Thank you guys. I think that that's been the most helpful thing for me Probably. in recognizing yeah. that not only in myself, but also as a parent, as a spouse, as a friend, okay. as a coworker, that whatever someone else is feeling or experiencing, it's not necessarily all of this emotion or this emotion, but might be emotional soup. And I can just sit there and hold that with them too and acknowledge that, mm-hmm. yeah, it's probably emotional soup and I'm not necessarily going to understand everything about it, but I can be there for them. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really good point too, because we also use the term emotional overwhelm. That's, the, that's that place really where our emotion are screaming to be processed that none of us really truly enjoy. It's an uncomfortable experience when we feel overwhelmed by our emotions, when we feel like they have control of us rather than us being able to drive the car of our engine, of our emotion. And so being able to uh, have emotion soup helps us to know that there's these places also before overwhelm that are multi-layered and multifaceted, like you've got all the flavors and all of that good stuff interacting. I just had written an article in the before the new year called Emotion Soup to put on my website, but the reality was the article was a little too raw. Like it was <laughs> my emotion soup needed to be in my circle of vulnerability because it had to do with some I would say traumatic circumstances where someone was attempting to steal my identity and I got lost my Facebook and Instagram accounts forever. And it was a, a huge deal in my life, even though obviously first world problem. Um, and I attempted to share that and connect with the internet around that and then realized, thankfully, before I posted it, that this was not for the internet, this was for an intimate person. And so I sent it to a few friends to sit with me in that. And I think that's really wise, whether if you can do that in emotional soup, that's better than doing it when you get too emotional overwhelm, where it's just flooding your system and we lose reason then, you know, we move into fight or flight and we're not in the place where we're going to be able to make decisions. That's when we post things that we probably should on the internet. (laughs) Talking about finding your people and in your example, just knowing who those people are that you're like, wait, I should actually be talking about this with my people instead of with the entire internet. What goes into finding those people that you're comfortable with? Because this doesn't just, maybe it does for some people, this doesn't generally just happen that all of a sudden you're like, Mm -hmm. oh, these are, these are people and and you don't really have to work on that relationship, I suppose. So what goes into actually finding and knowing who your people are that you can have this processing with. I think think we say this a lot on mental health one day, coffee hour emotion is, I think that's a whole episode in itself, finding your people. And I would say my 
my first few tips are to know yourself a little bit more, to be able to spend a little time with who you are and what you value, what should be important to you. And for most of us talking here, we're going to put Jesus at the top of that list. But at the same time, we talked about a little bit before the specific values of that. For instance, if I need honesty or compassion, if you take those two values of who Jesus is um, and what that means to me, that's going to look a, maybe a little different. <laughs> I Honesty and compassion can be held together, but with all people. Mm-hmm. And so finding the thing that I need really represented for me when I do have emotions through or when I need, need to either call that person in the middle of the night because of time of darkness in my life or because something exciting happened and I want to share that and have someone sit with me in that. This emotion soup doesn't to be all the unpleasant things, right? It's often a mix of both. And so being able to find the people that share similar values is important, but that means we have to know ours a little bit more. Also, like I said, to be able to connect with God, I do think that it brings us to a solid foundation in order to then look around and see who we want to be around. I think that is part of the Holy Spirit's work that we take for granted and don't talk about a little bit, that he's working between us. And so when I have spent my time with God and I just absolutely believe that he has the time and energy for me, that he wants to be with me, it's easier for me to pick up for lack of a better term, energy from other people that I'm going to connect with well. And I believe that energy is the Holy Spirit working and saying, hey, these are your people. I'm going to be able to discern that would be the the scriptural or spiritual word you would use for that. We have more to chat about here on Mental Health Monday on the Coffee Hour. We'll continue the conversation in just a moment. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. At Concordia University, Wisconsin, we believe you were created for a reason, to use your God-given gifts to help others, to live a life of self-sacrifice in a me-first world, to live a life that's uncommon. Whether you're taking one of 50-plus online programs or learning with us in person on the shores of Lake Michigan, you'll be equipped to make an uncommon impact. Learn more at cuw.edu. Concordia University, Wisconsin. Live uncommon. Welcome back to the Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. It is Mental Health Monday with Deaconess Heidi Gaiman. We are in Emotions and the Gospel. Great book, great resource. Today, our topic is connection. What do we need? What is required for emotional processing through connection? Is there like a prerequisite? <laughs> I was just going to say, like, required is probably not a word I would ever use. We don't want to add those shoulds, right? Um, Mm -hmm. I do think a willing spirit goes a long way. Is this a stature? That's not the right word. A being able to have grace as our default goes a very long way. When we be when we look at people around us and have expectations that are law-oriented, whether around specific things or just in general, when we have like extremely high expectations or we have a negative outlook of people, that's they're maybe not in the place. <laughs> We're not the people who then should be offering ourselves out. And I mean, we see this. We, I think because especially as Christians, we want to serve God and we believe that's part of what we're called the Jewish disciples. Sometimes we might need a speaker note to us that getting to know ourselves or being with God in our in our, emo- our own emotions, in our own life, and our own expectations before we can be the people who are connecting well with other people. And I honestly think that is an important place of the gospel even in our life to know our limitations on connecting so that we can go back out there and do it again. So you you throw out the term withness. In this, sec- in this chapter, and I love your explanation of this. And also when you write it, it looks like witness, but it's not. It's withness. I really like that. Oh, that's so funny. I've never noticed that. <laughs> can, you, can you unpack that a little bit? What does it actually mean? How is that term helpful in us as we consider what it means to be 
connected to each other. Absolutely. I'll actually take a moment just to read one little paragraph from the book about this. Weakness is one of my favorite terms. I thought I made it up. And then after I had written it in a couple of my other books, and CPH had to tag it for the copy editors to say, Heidi made this word out, like, don't worry about it. I found it in another book that I had read with my kids, actually. And I was like, I'm not the only person who's in love with this word. So I'm glad to do that. The paragraph says, rather emotional processing through connection means intentionally choosing to be with the other person, to be present and available in a moment of emotion, what I call wit there. This occurs more than just in moments of emotional overwhelm. We can also talk with those in our lives about the topic of emotion, which is its own form of processing. Emotional processing through connection requires that one or both parties are comfortable in acknowledging, talking about, and feeling their emotions to some degree. It probably also requires one or both parties to work against their personal discomfort around certain emotions. Sitting beside people in their emotion or allowing them to share about their emotions says to them, there's space for that here. There's space for you here. And I would say, you know, it's funny because that paragraph accidentally answered Andy's question a little bit about the requirement. And I even used that word, Andy, like, look at that. But it's interesting to me that it ties into what you just asked, Sarah, that the idea of witness is about saying with or without words to that other person, there's space for you here and there's space for that, that you're experiencing here. And that's just such an important thing in our, in our world. The world is hard. There's a lot of judgment. There's a lot of hard stuff that makes us feel judgment, whether people bring it in or not. And we often feel small. We feel like there's not a place for us. Shame tends, well, it does feel our sense of belonging, which is that idea that there's space for us here, that God put us here for a purpose. All of those massively spiritual concepts are impacted by this. And so as people together in connection, when I let you know that you are not outside of God's grace, that you are seen and heard and to some degree understood here, that's really a representation, I think, of the gospel living in that moment for that person. It's almost tangible. And I think that's that space of the Holy Spirit that I was just talking about where you can kind of feel it. It's part of that sense of belonging that we have in our person. And so witness is incredible, especially when feeling outside of that gospel because of the shame of a certain emotion, whether that's cultural or family oriented, or because of something that came into our life that created that emotion. Or I mean, even just like as a woman on the earth, Sometimes I think that even my excited emotions are a little too much for people. And so for someone to be able to sit with me and who I am as an excitable person and say, there's space for that here, there's space for you here, that again is the gospel in my life, because especially when it comes between two believers. We talked a little bit about this earlier, or at least alluded to this a few times, the, the role that culture plays in, in connection. Can it can culture create challenges or or make connection easier? Mm. I do think rituals and routines are well, yeah, I think rituals are probably the best word to use here. That just the the normity of emotions in culture and how we deal with them when there's some specific rituals and ways we deal with things that really does help us. That's why funerals are really important. That's why grieving matters. And I think we really saw this in COVID when you couldn't go do the thing that you would do in order to be emotional for a moment about that thing and connect with others in that. And so I think those those rituals do help open the door for us to be able to have like emotional moments. And then the culture of our family, especially is like the stitching around that. It's, it's the blanket itself, if you will, that helps us be able to practice our emotions. So if my family culture says many different emotions are welcome here, here's some different ways to handle them. So there's like rituals within family about my emotion. That is going to make it, I would never use the word easy for mental health things or emotions or who I am as a person, but I would say, hmm, what's a good word? Accessible. Maybe. Yeah, that's a great word, Andy. Yeah, absolutely. It makes it accessible. I got a gold star today. 
Good job, Mira. Good job. I would use the word also navigable, Ooh. which I might have made up. I use it on everything. So tech doesn't like it. But when life is navigable, like I can steer the boat, yeah. <laughs> then I, I, I feel some amount of agency over my life. Like I'm able to make some choices where there are choices. I'm able to monitor that sense of shame and grace in my life and, and be able to see the gospel more clearly. I don't know that there's any particular culture out there that I would say, okay, they are the best at emotion. You know, I think that American productivity and capitalism maybe adds some of its own fun layers to emotion. But at the same time, I, I think all cultures struggle in their own way with emotion. And that's really interesting to me. And I listen to a lot of podcasts and think about it and, and just know that you have those layers of culture. Like I said, family is going to be the most impactful for all of us. How our family handles it is the most impactful. And then over that is our community culture. You know, we lived in Nebraska in our community culture there emotionally was a little different than our community culture that we experience in Michigan now. And maybe our ethnic culture have something to say about emotion. I'm sure they do. And then over that, you know, our space in this world, like I said, American culture, Western culture and thought and philosophy, if you will. And then the world itself and living in a world that's broken and hard and also beautiful. All those cultures are playing a role in this layer cake of emotion. Yeah, I know there's definitely a difference between like Midwest Lutheran culture and like Northwest Coast Lutheran culture. Just from talking with friends, there's definitely ways that we co-regulate differently in the church when you have a different culture going on. It's a, it's a very interesting phenomenon to think about, especially for us in the Midwest. We think that we rule everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's totally true. And I think we would actually do better to give more attention to the smaller cultural impacts. And I mean smaller than not the world or America or, you know, the culture that we exist in nationally. But looking at our community culture, our church, congregational culture, the culture of the LCMS with emotion, the culture of our family. Like I said, those smaller cultures in our life, maybe the school culture, that our children go to school or that we ourselves go to school. Those, those smaller things are going to have a greater cultural impact on us than even those larger cultural things, even though they do impact us. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned co-regulation and we've, I mean, we've been talking about connection this whole time. What happens when we kind of bleed through the boundaries of, of healthy <laughs> co-regulation and, and kind of take, take it a little too far? I'm oh, sure. There's these really strong defense mechanisms that we use. My, my favorites are the ones you guys mentioned in the question, especially transference, projection, and displacement. And I would say let transference is a little more complicated to describe. So let's stick with projection and displacement right now. So projection is when we throw an emotion onto someone else, but don't feed it ourselves. So I found this a lot with COVID and uh, mask wearing, for instance, like mm -hmm. that the children were freaking out about masks. And like, there's probably some truth in that. It was hard for them and their whole world changed. But you know what? It was mostly the adults who were freaking out. Kids are wildly resilient and roll with the punches of what is handed to them, given a safe space to process that and to understand it developmentally. And so just being aware of whether that anxiety is ours or our kids in particular, that's a big point of projection. You know, you might be like, oh, they're terrified of swimming, but are they? Or are you terrified of them swimming? You know, and there's likely a little bit yes and going on with that. But being aware that we do project, particularly to our offspring, I think this is so common, or to the, the children in our culture, which is really unfortunate because it's hard on them to hold our emotions for us. Like, that's not fair. And so I would say that's one area of projection. We do it with our spouses. We do it with close family members, especially. But you'll see it happen in meaning too, where you look across the room and expect someone else is feeling something. A lot of times we need to ask ourselves, like, wait, me or that are like that I'm picking this stuff up. That's projection. Another one, displacement, is where it's, it's like really similar. I'm going to say that's wrong. 
I think. So you could Google this or like internet search it and get the list of these defense mechanisms or look in the book even better. Displacement, again, is where we find it on another person. But I think projection is a little more related to the person like actually having to hold our emotion for us a little bit, like a deeper impact where displacement is like us mislabeling it a little bit more, but related. With just about a minute left, and we probably can't answer this all in a minute, but the role of vulnerability and boundaries mm. in connection. Mm. Yeah. The tension of those two things, which is very challenging for us as humans, we're, we're generally good at like either connecting or like pulling away, connecting or pulling away. But when we hold the two together, it's very helpful for us. Understanding again, what is ours and what is that personal goes a long way in us being able to set some of those boundaries and see what we need. Like I said, some of us will have seasons where we, we cannot sit with someone else in their stuff. And we will have moments where we need to say no. That's actually a point of connection. That seems healthy relationship instead of me like laying myself like a carpet for people to walk on. I'm not going to be very helpful in connecting and emotional processing when I am not in tune with my own needs and in tune what God is telling me, you know, and in tune where the Holy Spirit is leading me to. So vulnerability is our ability to drop some of those armors and be seen and connect and let the co-regulation be present. Boundaries are the place where we allow ourselves more space between us and other people in one way or another. And both those things have their place. And I hope that encourages those people who are a little weary of connecting emotionally. Very good. Emotions and the Gospel from Heidi Gaiman. This week's connection next week. I'm pretty excited about this. Forgotten emotions of scripture. Yes. Like, how did we forget <laughs> them? That's the great I know. Part. It was hard to title that. We'll talk about that next week. Oh, I love it. <laughs> Thanks so much, Heidi. Have a great week. Thanks, you too. You've been listening to The Coffee Hour. I'm Andy Bates. I'm Sarah Golseth. The Coffee Hour with Andy and Sarah is a production of KFUO. To support The Coffee Hour and KFUO Radio, visit KFUO.org. You can also text KFUO to 41444 or send an email to gifts at KFUO.org. And you can call us at 800-844-0524. KFUO. Christ for you anytime, anywhere. Anywhere.